everybody. I think some of the punchline was already given away, but uh, I will uh, continue here. Um, so today we're going to talk about crypto on Main Street, and we're going to dive into the state and future of retail adoption. Um, first off, I'm Will. I'm a project lead at Thesis, and we're a cryptocurrency uh, venture studio, and we build protocols and products. You just heard from Thesis, who is our privacy vertical, building uh, privacy layer for public blockchains. And today we're going to talk about Fold. Um, and Fold is all about introducing crypto payments um, into the retail space. So from the very beginning in 2014, Fold's always been about spending Bitcoin in the real world as fast as possible right now. And so we've done everything we can to really make that happen. Um, back in 2014, uh, our founders built a very simple app where you could get a Starbucks coffee and in return, you could get um, you could get some Bitcoin. Let me uh, catch up the presentation here. Um, so since then, we've facilitated tens of thousands of dollars of transactions. We have had over hundreds of thousands of dollars in Bitcoin volume going through us, uh, over 10,000 users. And so we've really learned a lot. And so today we're going to dive into the insights uh, that we've gleaned and kind of see where we're at today and uh, where we hope to be in the future. Uh, so we're going to cover our own crypto odyssey, uh, how we have interpreted the last 10 or so years of, of the space. Uh, then we're going to go into retail adoption. Uh, what's that looking like right now? Uh, what retail UX challenges that we see? And then where we see emerging tech and trends that are going to come and, uh, and enter the space very soon that we feel is going to change things in a very, very big way. So uh, we're going to first start off with our crypto odyssey. And um, I'm also going to get a little help from 2001 A Space Odyssey, because why not? Uh, there's very little stories that the hero's journey can't help you tell. Um, so back in 2008, uh, this is us jumping around the Genesis block for a few years. Um, we had a white paper. We had some super technical wallets. And that was really it. No businesses were accepting retail at this time. Uh, things, though, really started to change in 2012 when transactions started to gain momentum. Uh, we accept Bitcoin stickers were appearing at your favorite local coffee shops. Uh, Coinbase and BitPay onboarded Expedia and Steam. And Fold opened up retailers like Starbucks, Best Buy, Target to uh, retail transactions. So it was a very exciting space. And this was kind of the moment that we were like, oh, this is really going to work. It's, it's going to happen. And overall, we get, had about 5,000 businesses accepting crypto. And then as the space does, everything changes. And then the great bear market hits. Everyone understands what the uh, meaning of HODL is. Um, and our retail payments kind of generally goes into an existential crisis. Um, many of those retailers I mentioned before jumped out because of low volume. Uh, even internally in the Bitcoin community, there was debate about is Bitcoin even for retail payments at all? Uh, and this is also why you see things like Lightning Network also start to, uh, to be introduced um, and, and, and uh, proposed. So, and then to top it all off, everyone started talking about private blockchains, which really made us kind of consider, are we really working on the right thing? Um, luckily, that all changed. In 2016, 2017, Ethereum had launched a few, a few years earlier, and this is when we saw that kind of Cambrian currency explosion happen. Uh, Commerce-focused coins were entering the market, and there was really a renewed interest in the space. Um, but it was bittersweet, because at the end of 2017, we hit all-time highs. We were hitting all-time highs as an organization. But when you're in the business of selling cups of coffee, $40 transaction fees doesn't really work. Uh, and then. For good reasons and bad, 2018 came along, and the whole thing kind of came crashing down again. Uh, let me go back there. And uh, transaction value, volume dropped again. And uh, luckily, right now, we're seeing that volume start to stabilize. And so we've survived for the minute, for the moment, but uh, we're really wondering kind of what's next. And so we're going to get into that a little bit later. So if we were up in 2001 Space Odyssey, this is kind of what the retail growth of retail would look like from a global perspective. This is from coinmap.org. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's a, it's a good pulse check on uh, where we've come. So now the question is, um, how have the thousand of us or so 
working on crypto retail payments done? How have we done? How can we judge our success? Um, and what does adoption look like? If we can kind of take this as a giant proof of concept. Well, on the consumer side, there's about 1.7 billion shoppers in the world. 2.7 million of them are crypto retail shoppers. And those are not shoppers that do that frequently. It's once or more. So that gets us to an adoption rate of about 0.15%. On the retail side, there's about 120 businesses worldwide, 14,000 of which accept uh, crypto, leaving us at a 0.01%. Some sobering stats, at least it was for me after working here. Um, and I'm going to continue a, li a little bit more looking at retail engagement. Here's retail engagement uh, from uh, the amount of Bitcoin received from top merchant services. As you can see, it's really following the patterns of the market itself. Uh, and right now, definitely at a, we're nearly uh, half the amount of transactions uh, a year ago today. Some other stats here. So Bitcoin, about 2% monthly volume of uh, Visa. Uh, fewer than 10,000 users are interacting with Ethereum's uh, uh, blockchain uh, via decentralized apps on a given day. And fewer than 30 currencies have more than 400 daily active users. So um, at least in the space, when we start to look at where is everybody, I mean, these, these stats really come to, come to bear. But I think you've all seen this, this, uh, this graph before here. And uh, it's clear that despite all the awareness that has happened over the, over the, the uh, intervening years, we're still just at the edge of this chart here. Um, and in the context of retail adoption, back to that question, did we succeed in a proof of concept? Well, uh, here is uh, Palmer Jackson of Dogecoin. He's saying if Bitcoin was a startup, it would be dead. It hasn't reached product market fit. And in some ways, it probably would be dead if it was a startup, but it's actually a network, and it's a little bit more resilient, and so we have that going for us. And so when we judge it by an actual network, it's a little bit more encouraging. Here is uh, uh, one study that looked at crypto user growth versus internet growth, and we're actually pacing very nicely. So all the previous stats, we need to uh, definitely take, um, uh, we, need to, we need to accommodate and really uh, work to change those. However, overall in the big picture, um, we, we're doing okay. So we really find two things that are really stopping us from building the, the necessary network effects in order to make retail adoption a big thing. And this first one here is what uh, Medium is littered with articles and think pieces about this, of, of how can design save uh, uh, Bitcoin, how can design uh, actually finally bring upon retail adoption. And it is true. It's, uh, n it's the number one reason why active crypto holders don't actually buy things with their crypto. And it was actually mimicked pretty well when uh, we pulled the audience just before here. So um, we need to really work on the usability side. And we're going to jump into that uh, in a little bit. But in my opinion, the real challenge is distribution. Uh, I think we talk a lot about usability and design because that's what we have control over and that's what we as product teams really know how to do. Uh, distribution, on the other hand, is a whole other beast. Um, and we need to make it easier for people to get crypto to build these network effects, have more creative ways in terms of actually giving it to them. Um, and on top of that, in terms of distribution, only 92% 92, 92 of Americans do not have Bitcoin at all. And the number one reason why they say um, is that they don't see the point. And so we're here to change that. So we're going to quickly run through some of the most glaring UX uh, and usability challenges with the existing retail uh, space. And uh, I know this has given our team a ton of headaches, and it might give you uh, some as well uh, if you've been working in the space. But I'll go through them pretty quickly. So the POS experience. Uh, this title is actually from our head of design. And so it's not in any way a reflection of our design, but more about how crypto retail payments actually have to occur. Um, so you can see here that there's a lot going on this page. In order to just make a simple cup, buy a simple cup of coffee, they're about, you're given a Swiss army knife to make this payment. You can copy paste, you can open and launch a wallet, you can QR code, you can manually do that. And all of these come with very, very real and serious challenges that can make your transaction fail and, and create a very bad user experience. For a lot of the reasons, a lot of people jump out because they go through this, fail once, and never return. Um, 
especially with copy and paste, which is one of the most uh, popular ways of paying at a, in a retail environment. Um, oftentimes, users have uh, previous addresses saved to their clipboard, so they're sending to the wrong address. Um, are we talking about MBTC or BTC? Different wallets use different things. And so there's really no standardization, which makes the experience really hard. On the deep link side, um, if you press that open wallet button, if you're on Android, you actually get a choice of what wallet to open. On iOS, it's going to be a, 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 a gamble, and it could open up any wallet, maybe not even the one that you use. Um, QR for us as a team is, is obviously the best way to go, and so we, we try to do as much as we can to help people uh, use that. And that's just really only on the consumer side of making that payment. If you think of you put yourself in the retailer's shoes who has to actually train and engage their cashiers to accept this, um, it, gets very accept, it's, it gets very expensive to do so, and when the volume right now is so low, it's hard to make that uh, argument. All right, um, this one's about Bitcoin, kind of the, the slowest way to pay. Uh, you can't reliably initiate a transaction at the register uh, before you, uh, uh, and, and expect it to actually go through by the time you're there. Um, so the amount of time right now, average block times are about 11 minutes. So you need to have a lot of foresight to get your cup of coffee in the morning. Um, and it gets even worse when it's not just about block times, because 11 minutes, you know, it's been a lot worse. Um, but even at 11 minutes, we get even other issues. We're really bad at estimating transaction fees. And what happens with that is that if we go too low, then we actually actually get knocked to the next block and the user has to wait additional time. If we go too high, then all the users are calling, calling us up saying, why are we so expensive? So we need to find that real sweet spot in between. Third thing, there are so many currencies and they keep coming. Um, we believe as Fold that um, we, the retail space needs to be crypto uh, currency agnostic. Uh, we historically have been about Bitcoin, uh, but we always need to be prepared to add more currencies. We're going to be doing so in the short and in the future. The reason why currencies are hard is because they're not just a store of value, but they're a different payment method itself. Uh, Bitcoin does not transact the same way as Dash. Dash does not transact the same way as uh, Bitcoin Cash. They all have their, their own beasts, and it makes it very hard to create des and design specific for each currency. Um, but on this same thing, we've seen the rise of a lot of altcoins that are specifically about commerce, and we have yet to see on our side and, and from the, our partners in the space that any of those have dominated any significant market share. And so really, Bitcoin is what we're seeing is powering most merchant transactions. All right, fees are definitely a problem, but it's not the ones that have been constantly decried about. Uh, these are not minor fees that I'm talking about. Uh, $40 fees back in the big congestions of 2017 uh, were, were a problem. Again, a, a $250 uh, coffee for with a $40 fee, total is $42.50, that, that hurts in the morning. So um, right now, the good thing is you can see on this chart here that Fees are currently the lowest they've ever been and in, current, in terms of Satoshis per byte. So we have nothing to complain about then. It's working as planned, um, but yet still it's too slow. Um, it's, it's too expensive, especially when even if you're at a dollar payments, even a coffee, it's, it's too much. But in my opinion, the, the even larger issue with fees is, is the, uh, the concept of how fees work in Bitcoin. Um, for mainstream re uh, consumers, the model is I go to a merchant, I pay with my credit card, they take the fee, and they reward me with a loyalty point or some reward. With Bitcoin, I am paying and I'm taking the fee, um, and hopefully my transaction goes through. So it's a bit, a bit counterintuitive. Um, so these are only a few of the problems that we're seeing that have led uh, Bitcoin and crypto holders to actually not even engage in crypto uh, retail payments. Um, and it's definitely one of the main reasons uh, that UX and usability needs to be an absolute focus of the entire, of the entire community. Um, and I think we'll get there. I think we have the design prowess. There's enough design thinking that's finally coming into the market. Normally, it was rare to even have designers on some of these early teams. Uh, but I think that's all changing for the most part. Um, what I think the problem is, is that um, the challenges that have stymied this consumer adoption, even among active crypto holders, 
is that we're turning another uh, cycle of the app infrastructure uh, cycle. I, I, a recent Union Square Ventures article came out. Danny Grossman and Nick, uh, sorry, Danny Grant and Nick Grossman wrote about that. I think is pretty applicable to this situation. And for right now, we're seeing with crypto that the current infrastructure that we're in protocols that we're built on are kind of being pushed to the farthest bounds that they actually can be pushed. And right now, um, they're not meeting what co consumers uh, both. Um, early adopters and mainstream have come to expect. And so right now we're turning back on uh, the infrastructure to kind of optimize those underlying protocols that will lay the new foundation for these new apps and new capabilities to come through. So I'm really thinking that we're going to turn now to um, how, uh, what exact infrastructure and protocol improvements that we are most excited about here at, um, at uh, Fold. All right, uh, the most obvious here, Lightning Network is what everyone's talking about. We are extremely excited about this for, for many reasons. We're live on testnet with a node, and we've learned quite a bit already. Um, most off, there is no one thing called Lightning Network. There's many ways to implement it, uh, and there's a lot more to learn uh, for us as a space, best practices to be uh, created. So I'm looking forward to sharing with the community and, and learning from them as well. But the best thing about Lightning Network is that we get to hit the reset button. All of the UX, major UX challenges that I just reviewed, we get to kind of slash right off the uh, transaction POS experience. So it can just be a POS experience. Um, here's what we like about it. Number one, there's no more data entry. Uh, the no, no more copy and paste. None, no, the invoice model changes all of that. So it's a very simple, clean experience for the consumer and very much uh, more in tune with what uh, they're actually used to doing now. Um, secondly, instant confirmations. Right now, the, the, uh, the uh, sending a payment is the confirmation of the payment with, uh, with Lightning Network. Uh, previously, you can send uh, with, with existing protocols, you can send the transaction, and then you have to wait for it to be confirmed, which creates a long waiting process that may or may not actually go through. So making that instant is going to really change how this all happens. Um, Another really important thing for merchants and consumers is that it's actually private for the most part. Um, new account details and account transactions are stored and are not publicly available for everyone in the network, although there is ways to actually get uh, insight into, into those transactions. And then lastly, lower fees. When you're in the uh, Bitcoin or coffee business, again, lower fees, thank, thank you. Micropayments are now a thing. And what I think we're going to see is that we're going to see a, a huge amount of new use cases about uh, uh, retail crypto payments come out as a result of this. And so uh, now the speculation aspect, the retail payments aspect, we're going to have a ton more activity in the space that may not be specifically retail, um, but payments in general. So I'm really excited to see what, what, what we do with that. Um, but it's not all easy, and we see a lot of issues with it. Um, there are many implementations right now. None of them are quite proven. And so us, trying to, uh, us adopting this early in the space, we need to test this out and have a community and a culture of sharing and, um, and presenting kind of your learnings here. Uh, the second thing I think is going to be the hardest thing with Lightning Network is the channels. Channels are complicated. They're counterintuitive. And I think we as designers and product teams are going to have to answer this challenge by making this as in the background as possible so that we can actually get ahead of our consumers and create a seamless experience without really making them dive down into the channel aspect, um, unless they want to, of course. Uh, we're going to see unexpected changes here. It's, the market is going to change the actual protocol. There's a lot of things that are up in the air. And so again, we're building kind of uh, on a bridge to nowhere at the moment, but we're all going to have faith that we're going to get to the other side. So we're really excited about that. And lastly, the network needs times to grow. It needs a lot of time to grow. Um, now, how long that will take, I don't know. But right now, it's looking really great because it's growing very fast. There's about 3,000 nodes currently live. Uh, it has about a uh, capacity, about 100 Bitcoin. So uh, we are already seeing even how young it is um, at quickly growing into the solution that we've always hoped it to be and that we think it will become. So now I'm going to change to some uh, other things that are slightly farther off, but are equally exciting for us and that give us faith in the future. Um, Mimblewimble, 
a protocol with a funny name is a transaction protocol that is based on confidential transactions, which is super important for merchants as it keeps account balances and transactions private. Um, another thing this is going to do is that uh, the fee structure is very flexible. So with Mimblewimble, that's going to allow us to mimic the, the, the existing uh, behavior of retail uh, payments. So we're going to be able to put uh, transaction fees on the merchant, uh, split them between the merchant, put them on the consumer. It's going to be really up to, um, up to us to decide how that happens, but at least gives us the ability to uh, look into that. Uh, secondly, it's going to be faster than Lightning in theory, uh, which is great. Lightning's already fast. Um, I guess we could, we could do with a little bit faster, I guess. Um, and additionally, it's going to be compatible with Lightning down the line, so that's going to be really exciting. Uh, and then an actual implementation of Mimblewimble is Grin, which is a cryptocurrency and a blockchain. And uh, it's also focused on solving all the scalability and privacy issues that we've seen uh, with Bitcoin right now. Uh, Grin recently just uh, uh, finished their first atomic swap, and that presents essentially a future where any currency can be swapped instantly and without the need for an exchange. And that, in terms on the retail side, if I'm a retailer and I want to be able to accept any currency, uh, no matter where you're coming from, uh, uh, Grin is actually going to make that possible uh, with, that, with minimal uh, steps in between. Uh, and then the other exciting thing is on the crypto, uh, cryptocurrency side of Grin. Um, because it's a linear release schedule, the, uh, we're not going to see the, the, the same volatility that we saw with Bitcoin. So the supply and the, st the stability of the coin is going to be, is gonna be a, uh, one tenant of it, which means that speculation is not going to be uh, necessarily privileged. Instead, spending it is, going, is how you're going to get the most utility from this currency. And for merchants, lowering that volatility threshold from one day my balance is this to this is going to be a, 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 huge, uh, a huge win for the space. All right, a um, couple other things. Smarter wallets, we love bread, metal pay, the recently uh, cash app, better tools, naming services, block stack. I don't have too much time, but I really encourage you to take a look at all of these. This, along with everything I just said before, is going to significantly change retail payments uh, forever. And that, I think that's going to happen within a year to two years. So this is not a far off thing. This is something that we can look forward to very soon. But overall, 92% of people in the US don't have crypto. 11% cite UX as the, core, as the core obstacle. So even if we solve the UX problems and all of this, that's still not going to be the golden key here. So what about the other 89%? I mentioned earlier that they actually don't see the point. They don't see how it relates to their daily life. And that's the real design challenge and distribution challenge that we have to solve. And today, crypto is primarily only bought. There's one use case for it. Tomorrow, we need crypto to be bought, it to be earned, it to be won, it to be gifted, vested, paid out. We need to be very creative about all the different use cases. Um, Metal Pay, previously I mentioned, is one of those that is doing a great job at that. Each kind of a Venmo-like, crypto-native Venmo-like app, where for each, each uh, send or receipt of US dollars, it gets uh, uh, crypto credited to your account. So what we're doing is, even if you're one of those people who actually don't see the value of it, um, one thing we know at Fold is that if you're given currency, you're going to spend it. So I want to talk about here about what I see are the major on-ramps ahead of how we're going to solve this distribution challenge uh, and get all the rest, uh, get make it a bring it to the mainstream essentially. Um, so again, I said, a lot of more ways we need to buy it, earn it. Some of these use cases are going to be, our, we can tap into existing services. We don't have to make up new things. We can uh, set out loyalty points, in-game uh, points, uh, airline miles, uh, uh, employee benefit programs, shared economy payouts, energy saving credits. All of these have the opportunity to onboard a massive amount of people in a very short time without asking them to use any different services. Because one of the things I think we underestimate is that our services are so much better than the centralized versions that mainstream users are going to see that right away. And I think I want to challenge that because we need to get smarter about how we bring out the value of, of cryptocurrency and blockchain app and decentralized applications in a, in a better way. 
Um, so here are some of the main on-ramps. I got, I got five seconds here. Um, one of the main ones here is incumbents. We are going to see a flood of the squares, the Venmos. Uh, Square you just did a study. 60% of their merchants would be willing to accept Bitcoin in lieu of dollars. That's not alongside dollars. That's instead of dollars. That's, that's massive. And if they were to enter the market, that would change the entire thing. Retailers, some loyalty points and gift card programs are worth more than many countries' GDPs alone. If we can bring those to the blockchain and get those into cryptocurrency, we're going to go a long way. Unstable economies. It's a weird one, but Venezuela has 10 to 15 percent of all the merchant activity going along around the world right now. Um, it is, and this is happening in places like Argentina, Iran, and there's a strong correlation of growth with the unstable kind of hyperinflationary currency. So we're going to see a lot of that. Um, and uh, a lot of these uh, crypto native apps. Fold included, I mentioned others, Brave, Augur, all of these that are finding creative ways about distributing more cryptocurrency to more people without putting a paywall or a purchase in front of them at the beginning. For us, it's going to be about loyalty. We think that currencies, at the end of the day, we're going to be have many of them, and it's going to be about which is the best one to use at the moment. And so for Fold, what we're committed to is helping you navigate that, when to use that, and also getting you rewarded for each of your purchases to map more of how uh, retail happens today. So uh, sorry for the next speaker. I took a little bit more time. But thank you all. Um, I look forward to answering any questions after.